Hi, my name is Carrie Barnum. Thank you for joining us for Free Advice Friday, the hour every Friday where we talk about book marketing, publishing, and the business of being an author. Today, we are going to answer questions live at newshelves.com forward slash FAF. You can join us anytime. Or if you're catching the replay on YouTube, you can certainly email in questions for the next Friday. And that email is simply info, I-N-F-O, at newshelves.com. Today, we've got a couple of questions coming in. And the first one is coming from Jamie. And Jamie had questions kind of specific to the library market. So I wanted to get those um, answered. So number one, the first question was, is getting your book reviewed in book list and library journal along with using direct mail the best ways to market and make sales to libraries throughout the U.S.? So Jamie, that's a really good question. And direct mail, actually mailing things almost is obsolete now. I have to be honest, not saying no one does it, but most people don't. Um, it puts a lot of resources, a lot of money for stamps and paper and everything like that. Most everything has moved to email. And not only that, but a lot of um, a lot of libraries and things are using PO boxes. It's going to a central location. It's not necessarily coming to individual branches. So the buyer may not even see it, or if they do, they may not see it for a really long time. So email marketing is the most popular for libraries by far, unless you're local and can stop by. And as far as marketing, the, the thing to keep in mind is that libraries do take indie books. They take self-published books, but they need to be done well and they need to have a demand. So why would that library hope to have a chance of your book being popular? Does it fit a certain demographic? Is it a popular genre, something like that? And yes, it absolutely helps to have professional trade reviews. In fact, some of the bigger libraries like New York City Library, um, big California libraries, they will even say they only consider books that have trade reviews. So that is something to consider. Now, of course, with trade reviews, you have to pitch those typically at least four months prior to publication. So before your book is published, you need to pitch for trade reviews. It is free to pitch most of these. If you go to newshelves.com, go to our store, I do have a downloadable list of the most popular and trusted trade reviewers with links to their um, submission process. So you can do that. You as an indie or self-published author can do that. And the best one for libraries are going to be um, book list, library journal, um, doing any of the library journals. There's also like a children's um, library journal. So that is something that you would consider as well. But also Kirkus. Kirkus is one of those that you can't pay for Kirkus reviews. So it's that one's kind of on the edge, but I will say that Kirkus is known for not being easy when, when they review, even if you pay for it. Publishers Weekly is a great one. That one helps with bookstores, but libraries as well. Um, shelf awareness. If we're talking about um, certain publications, we'll go more to certain things like Rain Taxi is one that it takes kind of offbeat literature. So that might be a good fit. But yes, trade reviews, meaning they are this is what they do. They review books, they vet books, and not paying for them makes a difference. Now, I always get asked the question, should I pay for a review? And sometimes there is value just to getting that feedback, but know that anyone in the industry who is a buyer who does this for a living can spot a paid review versus a, a review because your book was chosen out of hundreds of submissions. Um, and didn't pay for that, we can absolutely tell the difference, not only by the name of who wrote the review, but also the review itself usually is a little bit different. So I'm not saying there's no value to that, just know that it's not in, indistinguishable from a review that was not paid for. So those are things to consider. Um, the second question Jamie had was, could you please explain about book discounts offered to libraries from the publishers. Do libraries expect them? If so, what is the going discount? So yes, libraries do typically expect a discount. They most often are going to be buying wholesale. So they would be buying from Ingram Wholesale, Baker and Taylor, or from some other wholesaler. Occasionally they'll buy from publishers direct, but not often. 
Um, and so they do expect a discount. Libraries, because they're not in business of resale for profit, will consider a lower discount than bookstores. So bookstores and retail stores, as we know, expect a 40% trade discount. And they expect that 40%. And if you don't have it, they're just not going to consider your book usually. But libraries, because they're not in the business of resale for profit, will they'll consider a book that is either full priced or lower discount. So they do appreciate and expect a discount. Usually around the 20% mark is about their low level of what they would take, especially if this is not a well-known book publisher or author. Uh, with that said, some libraries, about a third of libraries, they'll order directly from Amazon. If they really want a book or there's a lot of people asking for a book, they'll order directly from Amazon to get it quickly. So it really does go back to that popularity and demand and you know how it fits into their specific library. So that certainly matters. Let's see. All right, a question. Unembedded font problem uploading to Ingram Spark was just a glitch. Um, just took trying again and again. <laughs> ah, yes, sometimes our upload sites glitch. So if you are having a problem, I actually told someone this the other day, if you're having a problem on KDP, if you're having a problem on Ingram Spark, if you're having a problem on Drafty Digital and it's just not working, get out. If you can, delete that original listing, get out, give it a day, go back in and try to re upload. Um, much like with our old co computers and printers, we're like, just unplug it, unplug it for a minute, plug it back in. Sometimes it's the system glitching and it's not used. Sometimes it's literally in that listing and you need to restart it. So I'm glad that worked out for you, um, Elaine. All right. Um, I've booked a fussy librarian uh, newsletter for my new picture book release on July, or June 21st. Goodness. Um, what kind of feedback will I get from this booking? If any, will I have to just look for an increase in sales? Yes. So fussy librarian, when you do a fussy librarian ebook discount, um, and that is exactly what it is. You discount your ebook and then the fussy librarian promotes discounted ebooks. And if you would like a list of places that discount ebooks, if you go to newshelves.com, and you go to the people we like page down at the bottom, I've now added a list of um, a list of places that do discount ebooks. So if you're looking for places to run a discount promotion, go to the people we like page, scroll down to the bottom and it's under discount book promotion sites. So that's available as a free resource to you. I'll drop it in the chat. Um, and Fussy Librarian is one of those. And typically with these discount promotion sites, what they're offering is they're offering you essentially ad space. So you're buying space in their mailing and what you can expect as feedback is just to watch the sales. Now, your promotion will go live. You should be able to search it on their site on the day of promotion. If you are a subscriber of their newsletter, you should get a copy of that in your inbox and then you watch the sales. They're not going to give you a report on clicks or anything like that. That's not in their contract or agreement. So watch the sales and see how it goes. See, I've queried and gotten all no's. The nicest replies back I've ever had. Well, that's good. Should I query more? I won't be ready to work further on this book until mid-August. Is that enough time to publish in November with a decent marketing plan? Or should I write another and have two books in waiting? Uh, Caroline, that depends. It depends. Is this a current book and series? Is this a brand new standalone, a brand new series? All of these things play into your marketing and your publishing plan. As far as continuing to query, that's really up to you. Um, you have to query a lot to get responses, but when you're getting no's or you're just getting no's or you're getting feedback or you're taking that feedback into account. So there's a lot of nuanced things that go into whether or not you continue to query. And I've always said, this is a personal decision. How much does it matter to you? And what are your goals? If you know that you're not going to publish and market and do it with the the time and the budget that you feel your work deserves, 
keep on querying. But if you believe and you're like, hey, I got this, I can, I can self-publish, I can do my work justice, then make a plan and go for it. But that's a really personal decision. Again, it depends on the type of writing that you're doing. Is this a new book or a series? Because if this is the third or fourth book in series, stop, stop querying. Uh, you're not going to get a, a, a positive response there. Start with something new. So again, there's a lot of nuances there, but hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, do libraries order music, pop, and classical CDs on a yearly basis? Any tips to help convince them to buy your music? So yes, many libraries do have like a music library. However, more and more, they're moving away from book on tape, CDs, music CDs, and they're moving to digital downloads. The reason why CDs get lost, broken, scratched, and fewer and fewer people have CD players. No longer do we all have boom boxes. The newer cars don't even have a CD input area. So CDs are really, really kind of phasing out. So do they still buy them? Yes, however, it's limited because the need for them is more limited. We're seeing more digital downloads. We're seeing audiobooks on MP3 or sites through things like Overdrive more than CDs. If you have CDs, you can still pitch them. However, keep in mind, they will still want to order from a wholesaler. Libraries, very often will not order direct from a author or direct from a publisher, sometimes because they can't. It's literally the rules or the laws governing their specific library. And sometimes because it's just too much work to set up a new account for one product or one person. So they simply won't do that. So you would still need it set up in a easy to order wholesale system so that they could do that. So you would need to look into that more if you really would like to do um, sales of audio or music, something like that. All right, another question I had, um, a friend of mine and I would like to start our own publishing company, a LLC. And do we have any resources to help get you started? So I can't say that we have any resources specifically to get you started as creating your own publishing company. Um, I guess that's not totally true. On the New Shelves blog, we do have a blog about naming your publishing company. But if you are truly thinking about starting a publishing company, if you're starting a press, things that you may wanna consider is yes, creating an LLC so that you have limited liability. So you're setting yourself up like a business and take the steps that you would for setting up a new business. Have separate bank accounts set up. You want to make sure you have a dedicated email address. You want to make sure that you do file for your LLC. Um, and then if you are, as a publishing company, you kind of have to decide, are you publishing your own books only? Are you taking submissions from other people? Um, what will your contracts look like? Are you, are you doing hybrid publishing where it's subsidized by the author and then they get higher royalties or are you going for a traditional press where you are actually going to pay people for their manuscripts and pay them royalties? How are you going to handle that with accounting? You need to make sure that you have accounting system set up. So there are certainly a lot of steps that could go into setting up a publishing company, but it really depends on what you mean by this. Is this something that you two will work together and just publish your own books or publish co-written books or are you intending to put this company out and actually work with other authors because that right there, that one difference will change a lot of how you handle starting a publishing company. What's the best way to see my sales from Ingram per product? I can see their weekly or monthly sales, but I'd want more info to see what they're actually buying. So if you want to break down your Ingram, your sales from Ingram or Ingram Spark, you don't want to look in the dashboard. The dashboard gives you a quick look, but if you really want to know each of your products and how many are being bought, when they're being bought, then you need to actually run a report, a sales report in Ingram. And when you go into the sales reports, there are a lot of options. You can break it down by product. You can break it down by month and day and all sorts of things. So you need to go play with the report function in Ingram Spark or your Ingram dashboard so that you can pull the details that you need. 
Uh, let's see. Yes, yeah, so we've got talk about Midwest Book Review on the sidebar. And Midwest Book Review is a great review company. They um, really target libraries mostly. In Midwest Review Company, you can submit your book for free for review consideration, or they do have a program where you pay them $50 to review your book. And so the $50 is really um, to put you in the front of the line is what it is. And so for $50, um, they will read a PDF of your book and they will review it. And they're, they're a great company. Um, they're great over there. Uh, get one more question. Okay, I can buy up to 999 of my books from Kindle. If I offer to autograph each book and or suggest that I will include their name as a character in existing books or new book and just break even on mailing, et cetera, is it worth it for exposure? So I think you're saying you would give away books. I'm not quite sure, Lawrence, if you're saying you would give away those books or if you're saying that you would like sell them directly, but then you would put them as a character. Um, I think changing up characters in your book could be a big undertaking. I'm not sure that would be worth it. Um, charge them to break even. Yeah, so a lot of authors will actually buy books and they will sign them and then sell them directly. So you just have to keep in mind, once again, how are you gonna take payment? How are you gonna follow up shipping? And where's this audience coming from? Do you have a built-in audience? Are you gonna market it somewhere? Like, how are you going to get the people interested to buy the book? So you still have to market it. And I think that's the biggest thing is that it's not that it's a bad idea, it's that just like any other marketing for your book, you have to have a plan of how to market the book, who's going to buy it so that you can forward that on. Um, and so that is one of the things you really have to consider. And if you do this, if you're selling direct, are you tracking on PayPal? Are you going to be taking directly from your website? How are you gonna handle sales tax? Um, so again, it's not as bad idea is that it needs to uh, go a little bit more. And as far as adding names, I mean, 999 though, that's an awful lot of names. Um, so you would either end up naming innocuous characters, which is just filler that probably doesn't need to be there, or you would be having a bunch of different names in your book, which could get confusing to the reader. So I wouldn't necessarily do that. I will say I have worked with authors where we ran contests where people entered a contest in some way, or you know, anyone who buys a book and sends me the receipt will be entered to win to have their name put in the next book, something like that. So you can run contest and then choose a limited number of people to use their name or their suggested name in your book. Um, and that might be something that you could do, but promising a large number of people that their name or a name of their choosing is going to end up in your book could get a little dicey. And then also you have to keep in mind, um, okay, so let's say, let's say that I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna buy your book. I'm gonna buy your book and I've got the perfect name for you. And her name is Marsha. Her name's Marsha and I want her to be the meanest, nastiest character. And you're like, Okay, weird, but okay. And then I give this book to my sister. I'm like, look, Marsha, this this was named after you. Um, there are things like that, believe it or not, that do happen. And then it somehow blows back on the author. I've actually heard of this exact scenario happening. So I think that is one of the things to consider is that logistically, as Bob has said, I think it's a bit of a nightmare, but on a smaller scale, I think you could get great engagement. You can make it into a contest and that could work for marketing and for exposure. Um, so that's more of what I would consider if it were me. All right. Um, just recently, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Demonza. Demonza is a book cover company. And uh, I've been working with Demonza for years. Several of my clients work with them. And Demonza, um, their kind of head person over at Demonza put out an email last, last week. It was last Friday. 
Um, and he put out an email essentially talking about AI on book covers and AI art on book covers. And um, what they're saying essentially is that they're going to start using AI art and book covers, that AI is kind of, it's the future. We all know AI is impacting publishing, it's impacting the future. And so they have talked about using AI stock photos. Um, I don't know, I think that's a little oxymoron, but they are going to be using AI stock photos in their book covers moving forward. Now, authors will have the option to agree to AI art stock photos that will then be further manipulated and pieces put together to create your cover. And you'll have a 10% discount for using AI stock photos. And otherwise, you can say, no, I don't want any AI art in my cover and they will continue to work with you without AI art. Um, I do think it's very interesting actually that they're offering a discount for AI stock photos being in their book covers when they use stock covers, stock photos normally. So if the idea is that you're going to use AI stock art or stock photos from legitimate sources um, that are telling them Will this end up in copyright law later down the road a year or two? I've talked about this. I don't know. I think we're going to see something happen, but how will this affect these specific covers and things? I don't know. I do think Demonza has kind of done their due diligence as far as looking into it, but we'll see. Anyway, um, but I did think it was interesting. You get a 10% discount if you use AI stock photos, but they're using stock photos anyway. So I'm not sure why it would be cheaper to use AI stock photos than it would just be normal stock photos, except for with AI stock photos, maybe you can generate things more easily rather than having the time to research and look for stock photos that fit a particular element of the book cover. So I'm not quite sure on that. I thought that was interesting, but they will be using stock photos authors can opt out of that. And then they are also offering a service where if an author brings them a stock, if the, if the author brings them cover art, AI generated or not, if the author brings them a completed cover with no text on it, they are now offering a service where they will simply um, put the title, the subtitle and the author's name. So they will put the font and the text element on the book cover if you bring them the book cover image completely done. So that's kind of interesting. That's the first I've seen this. Um, really the first I've seen other than the fully AI cover companies, which are mostly do-it-yourself, low-budget kind of things. This is the first time I personally have seen cover company cover a, a well-known cover company come out and say, yeah, we're going to use AI art in our covers. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, you know, I think some people would be all on board with it. Some people know uh, the clients I have who are currently working with them have kind of said, I don't plan to use it, but I still plan to use the company. So I think it'll be interesting to see what happens. I think Demonza will certainly attract a clientele that is using AI art to create a cheaper cover and then pay Demonza to put the text on the book to kind of keep some of that professional feel, but keep the cost down by using AI art. Um, but I, I just thought it was interesting. So I don't know if anyone uses Demonza, but I like to keep on top of all of the, the movings and shakings in the community. And I, I thought it was a bold move. We'll see how it turns out for them. Uh, let's see. Yes, based on computer search versus a human search. And that's what I thought too, but it's still, they still have to find the stock photo regardless. So again, it's all interesting. Let's see. Nancy, we're up for a second printing of our five times award-winning book. Um, this book received a great forward review in January, February of 2022. Wondering if we should bounce one of the endorsements off the back cover and replace it with a statement from forward. Yeah, I mean, I think a forward review is eight ace in your pocket, Nancy. So consider putting a very shortened blurb on the front of the cover somewhere if there's room. So actually 
rather than bumping an endorsement from the back, consider using a, a single line, like no more than, a, you know, 10 words at most and doing a very short blurb with forward on the cover, or you may consider putting it on the back somewhere, but that's certainly, um, that's a great, exciting thing. So congratulations. Um, have my clients had good luck with Smashword sales? Yeah, I've gotten this question like five or six times this week, Cheryl. So Smashwords, as we know, was bought out by draft to digital last year. So if you are using draft to digital you now have access to the Smashwords um, bookstore and you also have access to participate in Smashwords sales and things like that. Smashwords is having a summer um, discount promotion where they are asking people if they're willing to discount their books for the Smashwords store, and then they will promote it out. Here is my personal opinion. Uh, this is my personal opinion from my personal experience. If someone else has different experience, feel free to drop it in the chat because I'd love to hear about it. But in my experience, Smashwords is kind of dated, which is why they sold out to draft to digital because draft to digital is more on the cutting edge of what's happening in technology and so they absorbed smash words because it just makes sense smash words was turning into a dinosaur and so will smash words sales give you sales in my experience i haven't seen much movement i don't think it's gonna hurt you i don't think you're gonna see any negative side effects but in my experience, when clients have used Smashwords and done their discount promotions that are strictly through Smashwords, they may have seen a sale or two, but nothing significant. So this is not like a Kindle Daily deal or something where it's like, oh my gosh, this is an opportunity. I don't think it's going to hurt you, but I really don't think that it's going to jump your sales in any massive way. So of course, you know, decide from there whether or not it's a good fit for you. But I would not be making this like your big summer promotion where like, this is my big marketing push. Um, I don't think it's gonna work like that personally. Let's see, back to our email questions. Um, had a question about whether it's still recommended to pre-register for your copyright. So I will, I will say first, I'm not a lawyer. I cannot give legal advice. If you have legal concerns, please consult a lawyer because they will give you the best advice. Now with that out of the way, as far as copyright is concerned, in the US, our rules here is that as soon as you write it, you put it on paper or computer, whatever it is, as soon as you write it, it is technically copyrighted to you. It is your work, it has been copyrighted. So technically you are covered by copyright as soon as you create that work or that manuscript. Now there are benefits to registering your copyright with the copyright office, namely that it's then you have a record of it. You have a legal document saying that you have copyright. So if you do have any issues, you have kind of that backup. And the other thing that a lot of people appreciate is that if anything does happen and you do go, um, if you need to sue someone, if there is a lawsuit regarding your copyright and someone's infringing on your copyright, if you have registered your copyright and if you've done it, to my understanding, within 90 days of your publication date, so it could be after you publish, but within 90 days of your publication, you need to submit for it you can actually go after more in damages. So you are eligible for more in damages if you do need to take the copyright suit and actually go after someone for your copyright or for infringing on your copyright, you are, you're eligible for more in damages. So that's one of the big things of why people will copyright is that for that reason alone. So you have automatic copyright in the US but submitting for copyright gives you a couple of perks, like having that official documentation. So occasionally we've had like Amazon come in and say, hey, we don't think that you actually have the copyright for this book or someone else is claiming copyright for this book. Can you prove it's yours? There are numbers of ways that you can prove that without the copyright filing, but the copyright filing, which it's under 60 bucks to like 
file it and everything. So for under 60 bucks, you have that copyright filing. You can send it to them and say, yep, it's copyrighted. It's mine. I'm in the right here. So that can give you some peace of mind. And then, as I said, for damages is the big thing. Um, but that is something definitely, if you've got big concerns about, you should be going to a lawyer. And as far as pre-registering, you can, you can pre-register, but the real benefit to my understanding as a non-legal advice, I'm not a lawyer, not giving legal advice, but to my understanding to get the benefit, you just have to put that out within 90 days of publishing. Um, and if you are a publisher submitting for copyright, um, there's the same thing. So keeping in mind that typically if you are the publisher, you are main, you receive distribution rights and publishing rights, but you are not actually given copyright. So I think that's something very important is if you are a publisher, very often the author will keep their copyright, but you as the publisher maintain distribution and publishing rights. Um, so just noting that difference there, but same thing within 90 days of publication, and you would typically be filing copyright on your author's behalf, and then also if you want to copyright your cover, different elements like that. So once again, many people will do it prior. You can pre-register pre your copyright. That's fine. You need to know that you need to send in documentation of your work, so you need it kind of at the final stages, um, because if you're changing massive parts after you've sent in your copyright, well, then it's not quite the same thing. So you do need to be towards the end, but within 90 days of publishing. Let's see, I know we had another question here. All right, um, I'm about to launch a crowd a crowdfunding site to self-publish my children's picture book. Do you have recommendation of social media consultants to collaborate with me and help promote the book to a bestseller status? Um, here's the thing: I'm always wary of anyone who who proclaims that they will get you bestseller status. The reason why is because it's really easy on Amazon to hit bestseller in certain categories. I have literally had a book that sold five copies, five, five copies in a day and hit bestseller in a category. And technically that book hit bestseller status. So when people are promoting that they will help you hit bestseller, I'm always very cautious. To me, that's a sales gimmick more than a solid plan. So I'll throw that out there. I know that was not the main point of your question, but I'll throw it out there anyway, because I feel strongly about it. Um, as far as working with someone for a crowdfunding campaign, I think I would be looking for someone specifically that has experience in crowdfunding and preferably whatever platform you intend to use, as well as social media. So yes, social media is this beautiful tool for promoting our crowdfunding, but there are a lot of tools right on the crowdfunding website. There are a lot of ways to set yourself up for success. You want someone who is knowledgeable in um, the different, um, they're not prizes, what are they called? Like the benefits of supporting you. You want someone who's got knowledge and experience of working through those different pieces of it. But you also need to know, you need to have your own social media platforms or you need to be working with someone months prior to build up your social media platforms. You also need to be thinking about your mailing or newsletter list because that's part of it as well. So sometimes crowdfunding campaigns will go viral, they'll get shared a lot. But usually that initial lift comes from your own audience. So you need to be make sure that you're working on your own audience. Um, and if you are looking for someone with experience in crowdfunding campaigns, I do have one person, um, two people. I have two people that I definitely know have experience with that. And so feel free to email me and I will happily try to connect you to them and see if they can give you insight or if they're available for work at the moment. Let's see, every now and then book sizes change for trim size, like what's popular. Initially it was six by nine, um, and sometimes it's five by eight. What are we seeing now? So trim sizes actually depend 
on a couple of things, but mostly what trim sizes depend on is going to be the genre. So hardcover books are almost always hardcover, like novels or nonfiction are almost always a six by nine. That's the standard size. If we're talking about the fiction genre, so we're talking about like a romance thriller, certain things like that, most trade publishers will do a five by eight or a five and a quarter by eight or eight and a quarter. It can differ a little bit depending on the publisher and the book. But typically, if we're talking about fiction, you're going to see a book more in the five by eight range. If we are talking nonfiction, however, nonfiction typically will go in the five and a half by eight and a half or six by nine range. It is much more likely to see a nonfiction book in six by nine or five and a half by eight and a half. Again, hardcover is almost always six by nine. So there are some nuances in there. And then for children's books, of course, that just depends. These square books, the eight by eight are very popular for children's books, but also the larger books, the, um, I think it's, seven by 10 and eight by 11 are the two sizes. So the bigger books are very popular with children's books and square books are popular. And then of course, if you've got board books or something like that, we typically see a smaller size. So it definitely depends. Yes, we do see a shift. So what originally a long time ago, a lot of books were six by nine because it was cheaper for printing because you made the best use of your paper that way. You cut the paper in half, you got six by nine. And so that is why originally it went that way. However, with the onslaught of print on demand, what happened is print on demand because it was cheaper and the most convenient is that originally most books were printed in six by nine. And when print on demand, that was the only size option available for some printing options was six by nine. So trade publishers go, well, we're doing offset print and we want buyers to know that our books are different than those print on demand books. So we're going to do a different size. And that is why a lot of fiction moved to like five by eight or somewhere around that range. So yes, there is a shift occasionally. Um, we see it pretty consistent as far as trim sizing goes, um, but that is definitely something that changes from time to time. And usually there are small nuances in the publishing community of why it changes. Um, and then certainly you'll have special books. You'll have books like slim little pocket volumes that are like a four by six or a four by seven um, and smaller things like that. But those are typical trim sizes. Let me see, back to email over here, see if I have anything left. Um, all right, I'm interested in exploring the advantages and limitations of utilizing KDP Select, as well as comprehending the advantages of distributing an ebook through Ingram. So KDP Select is the program that gets you into Kindle Unlimited. And Kindle Unlimited, of course, is like the Netflix of books. It is the program where someone can pay a monthly subscription fee and read as many books as they want in the Kindle Unlimited program. And so the benefit is, is that if you're an unknown author, if you have an unknown book, people are more likely to try your book if it's on their subscription and they're not shelling out cash to read it initially. So if I don't know who you are and your ebook is $4.99, but I don't know who you are, you don't have a ton of reviews, I'm more likely to say, huh, well, I'll download it on Kindle Unlimited because if I read five pages and I hate it, I just return it. I didn't pay anything. Same idea as if I'm scrolling along on Netflix, I'll give crazy things a try because I'm like, well, it's here, why not? Um, whereas if I were going to Amazon and I was paying to rent that movie, I'm probably going to be more selective. So it's that same idea process. And that's why it can help, especially with newer authors who maybe don't have a big publishing house behind them marketing and things like that. So that is why you may kind of consider it that way. As far as if you would like to do wide distribution with your book, Ingram is an option. Ingram Spark is actually not my favorite for ebook distribution. I prefer Draft 2 Digital, um, mostly for ease of use. I think their, their platform is a little easier to use. You can schedule promotions and things like that, but they both work and they will get you into um, 
Barnes and Noble for Nook, Kobo, which I think is kind of a rising star in eBooks and audiobooks. So Kobo, it'll get you into iBooks. It will get you into Overdrive for the library system. So which one to use kind of depends on your book, your goal, your audience, and what kind of marketing you have behind you. Let's see, our market is global, but Ingram will not give the list or locations of outlets overseas. So typically there is an entire list. If you go into the Ingram Spark Agreement or the Ingram Agreement, they do have an entire list of everywhere they distribute to. So that is available to you. They don't get individual locations, but they do have an entire list of who's available to order it. Now, keep in mind that if your book is print on demand, it's available to the global global market, meaning that people can go on to iPage, which is the Ingram wholesale platform for buyers. So if they live in New Zealand, they can go on to iPage and buy your book. If they live in Canada, they can go on to iPage and buy your book. If they live in the UK, they can go on to iPage and buy your book because there are printing facilities that Ingram has all over the world that will print and ship books. So they can purchase it, but that does not mean a book is physically in location. So that's a big misconception is because it's like, okay, upload your book to Ingram Spark and it will get into Barnes and Noble. Well, it'll get into Barnes and Noble online. It'll be available so Barnes and Noble buyers could buy it to put it in the store on their shelves, but that doesn't mean they will put it on their shelves. In fact, most books will not make it in a store and on the shelves. Um, so that is something we're definitely seeing. And Barnes and Noble, I'm sure you all have heard, it's been a lot in the news recently that Barnes and Noble is doing all sorts of new things. Their new CEO is really shaking things up. Um, in some ways he's giving direct managers and the individual stores more freedom to buy books they know are popular in their region. They're giving managers more freedom to say, hey, this is just a popular book. I don't care that maybe it didn't make the New York Times bestseller list. It's popular. It's trending on TikTok and they're giving managers and buyers more freedom to buy those things. Um, but at the same time, they are really on a aggressive track. They're really, really trying to have books that people want to have books that they're not returning. They want to minimize returns. So there's a lot of things going on and that go into whether or not a book will be stocked in any individual store. And Barnes and Noble certainly seeing a lot of changes there. I've seen a lot of those changes personally working with authors, um, but they are in a lot of communities. The Barnes and Nobles have been given more freedom to support local authors, author signings and things like that, which I think is very exciting. Yes, Jane Freeman's hot sheet does have, um, she talked a lot about Barnes and Noble changes. If you subscribe to the publisher's marketplace newsletter, they have been covering Barnes and Noble changes quite a bit. So um, you guys know, I'm like a news junkie for the publishing world and I just can't help myself. If there is a marketing newsletter, if there's something out there, I probably subscribe to it. So the hot sheet by Jane Friedman, highly recommended and our own Bob Eckstein does um, have a cartoon in one of her hot sheets every time. So that's always fun to see. Um, the Publishers Marketplace has a great newsletter. These are paid subscriptions, just so you know. Um, Shelf Awareness has one, that one's free. A lot of the review sites like Forward and Publishers Weekly, then Publishers Weekly is paid. You can get the printed magazine um, or the online subscription. I get the printed magazine. Um, and so there are so many ways to get publishing news. But um, that's one of the things I try to do for all of you is that I consume so much of it and I try to stay on top of it. And then I try to share highlights with you. But you can certainly go get your own subscriptions. I find them very valuable to know what's going on in the market. So always exciting news there. All right, you guys, I think we answered all of your questions, but if we didn't cover something you wanted to hear about, let me know, email me, info at newshelves.com. We'll cover it next week. We will be back, same time, same place, Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern. Thank you for joining me here, and I hope that you have a fantastic weekend. Bye, everybody.